Hello there, and welcome to another episode of News from the Gelding. Okie dokie, right, so today I'm going to be reviewing and recommending Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur C. Clarke. Now, I first discovered this book um, at the tender age of 17 on the shelves of my local bookshop. And I saw this cylinder shaped doodad on the front and I thought instantly Star Trek IV Voyage Home whereby this great big probe, alien probe, comes into our solar system shutting everything down because they're looking for fucking whales. But whales have been made extinct so James T. Kirk and Spock piss around the sun somehow slingshotting themselves back in time to scoop up some whales and bring them back to appease these um, murderous aliens. But anyway, it's nothing to do with that, nothing of the sort. This is a very different kettle of fish altogether. And it made an amazing impression on me when I first read it, introduced me to the work of Arthur C. Clarke, and Christ, I never looked back after that. Devoured science fiction ever since. Now, <clears throat> this one, I'll talk about the premise of the book, to begin with and then I'll go a little deeper into what I think of, think of it. Okay so Rendezvous of Rama was published in 1973. I was never that keen on the title Rendezvous of Rama. I think it should have just been called Rama but there, there we are. Um, and at the very beginning it kind of sets the scene. So um, it's all set in the future. So it says at the beginning in 2077 um, an asteroid crashes to Earth and wipes out some of northern Italy, uh, destroying a few cities, killing 600,000 people. And so as a response to that, um, this system of observatories is set up called Space Guard, which is looking out for other potential threats that might, um, you know, hit Earth again. So it forwards another hundred or so years into the future and Space Guard picks up something. Now this something is very interesting because it's it's an interstellar object. It's come from beyond our solar system and it's moving incredibly fast, 100,000 kilometers an hour. And it's heading straight for the sun. Really intriguing. They then realize that this object isn't irregular. It's very uniform and it's a cylinder of all things perfectly um, flat on the sides, slight blemish on one side as though it's been hit by something, 50 kilometers long, 20 kilometers wide, and a perfect cylinder that's rotating. Now this, when I first read that, it really, really intrigued me. Our first experience of a extraterrestrial race, and it comes in the form of this perfect cylinder, moving very fast, unknown intent. There's no communication of any sort. It's completely silent as an object. They work out that it's probably been traveling the interstellar gulf for millions of years. So what the hell could be inside? So that as the title suggests, there is a rendezvous with this said object. It's called Rama, by the way, because they initially classify it as a comet, perhaps, um, or even speculate that it could be like a the dead core of, a, of a, another star that's blitzing its way through the solar system. But anyway, so Rama, they're going to go inside the thing because there could be something inside. The perfect adventure, the perfect form of exploration. So before I get into that, if you want to stop watching now and go and read the book, please do. I'm not going to give any um, spoilers away, but I'm going to talk about what they find inside which isn't really, it is a spoiler, I suppose, but it, the whole book covers the ex exploration of the interior. Um, it coincidentally, not coincidentally, but as an aside, the music at the beginning, um, Diesel Power by The Prodigy, um, I chose that because when I read the book um, as a 17 year old, for the first time ever, I've never done it since, I listened to music whilst I was reading the book. So I read, um, I listened to, what was it, Fat of the Land, the album that was out at the time by The Prodigy, on repeat whilst I read the book. And it was the perfect soundtrack to the story. And I, I imagined the story as it unfolded in a fairly cinematic way. I imagined it could be a film, definitely could be a film. Anyway, 
So before we get into that, let's have a look at some of the covers that have adorned this story in the past. Okay, so right, the first cover we've got here was um, a hard, hardback um, cover. Um, and for some reason, we've got Jupiter looming quite um, prominently in the background. I can only assume this is a reference to a Space Odyssey that had Jupiter in the story. Um, but it doesn't appear in this one. But we've got Rama there dangling down beneath. Shut the door. Um, looking slightly diminutive there. It should be a bloody great hulking thing, but it looks like a little, uh, looks like an earplug or something else. Um, okay, there's that one. Now this is the cover I've got. Um, my the, the, the book I've got here with me isn't the original because some blighter stole it when I lent it to them to read and never gave it back. That's probably um, an indication of how good the book is. They couldn't um, release it from their possession. So here we have the cylinder again um, taking up a nice part of the cover but it's it's very hard to do justice to the scale of the thing so they've they've put this um, human spaceship here which is um, doing the rendezvous yeah and quite quite nice I quite like it next one right we've got the spaceship again approaching Rama slightly more um, dramatic uh, lighting with this one um, but again, the emphasis is on the, the spaceship or the human craft that's used, um, used to uh, rendezvous. And again, we've got the Masterworks edition here. And here, where the hell is Rama? I'm assuming it's the lower portion, um, but we've got just a tiny part of it. And again, prominence is given to the uh, human spaceship blasting its thrusters all over the place. Okay, and the last one here is a really nice cover and it shows the interior of Rama. So what we can expect to find inside, um, which is an internal world. Yeah, so what they, they end up finding is this great big cavity. Now, initially it's all dark inside um, and they can only assume it's just empty. They just don't know what to find in there. And that's, that was quite a, a sinister beginning, really, because you felt for them, really, this, this small party of uh, people that were going to explore the interior. It's just total darkness, near absolute zero, just like space. Um, but there is atmosphere down there, as they discover. Um, now, importantly, the people that do the exploring are all professional people, led by uh, Commander Bill Norton. Um, and unlike the sequels that come after, there's three other books that come after. This book doesn't really, like, like a lot of Arthur C. Clarke's um, writing, characterization isn't a big concern for him. For him, the important thing is exploring theories. Um, based on hard science. So this is a hard science fiction book. Everything he's kind of worked out, the, he's calculated the physics that run this um, object. So the fact that the, the cylinder is spinning creates a pseudo-gravity due to uh, centrifugal forces. He explains the, the Coriolis effect of the water that might be falling and moving because of the centrifugal fugal force. Um, he speculates about potential weather systems, um, the effect that um, the, the outer hull heating might have on the internal uh, weather of Rama. Some really interesting ideas. But characterization is, is definitely um, uh, separate to what he's exploring. Now the, the thing I loved about it um, was that there's lots of questions posed um, by the explorers about what they might be seeing here because there's a lot of, there's building, there's kind of cities dotted around this cavernous space. There's a central sea that circum, just circumnavigates the whole cylinder. Um, and there's an island in the middle with a very odd geometric uh, city of spires. And then on the other side of the the sea, there's a great big cliff, and beyond that, an even stranger tapestry of geometric shapes and very odd indeed. So it gets your mind thinking, and very few um, questions that they have are answered. Some of them are, 
some of the things that are theorized about the weather and things like that are kind of explained but the stranger aspects of the this alien spaceship are they're teased um, you're teased really um, but your mind is whirring trying to work out what the hell these things are for um, very surreal as well but that for me is the the joy of the book it gets you thinking and not giving away spoilers too much here but you you finish the book still not knowing what the hell this thing is for and what it's doing but you're left to ponder the possibilities and so certain possibilities are seeded in your mind and you're left to ruminate on what they might be so as i said earlier there there were sequels there were three other sequels rama 2 garden of rama and rama revealed now those three books were written in collaboration with gentry lee um, a collaboration they did on some other works um cradle is one that i've read um, and you can tell that these books have been written really by gentry lee um, Arthur C. Clarke's involvement is more on the theoretical and side and ideas, things like that. Gentry Lee was slightly more, he was big on the old characterization. It was more of a, a space opera in a way. But I enjoyed them immensely. Um, but the problem is that as good as those books are that follow, it explains pretty much everything. And by the time you get to Rama Revealed, everything has been revealed. So the sense of mystery is kind of killed. So yeah, perhaps just read the first one. <laughs> but the second one, actually, when I I reread it the other um, just last year, I was blending one and two together in my mind. So I was thinking, well, why hasn't this happened yet? But yeah, so the second book is really good as well. They're all good. Let's just get to the yeah. Let's just be honest here. They're all bloody good. Um, okay. So the the last thing I'd say is that. Um, this idea of this this internal world um, in this hollowed out, whatever it is, um, it's nothing new. But I, I, I mean, Larry Niven's uh, Ringworld, for example, that that was released in 1970, so before uh, Rama. But I think Arthur C. Clarke was the first one to really think about the the physics involved in how such a, an object might uh, work. Um, in very great detail um, and it's been used a lot in science fiction ever since um, Greg Bear's um, Eon for example that's that's very similar um, but again that took it to another level um, Peter F Hamilton with the habitats they're all you know it's a brilliant idea and you know it could work um, and it makes sense if you have a very large community in space the way to create gravity is to use the centrifugal force. I mean, it's an, an extrapolation of, of Arthur C. Clarke's earlier work with um, a Space Odyssey with the, with the cylindrical um, or the ring uh, space station. So it's probably where his mind went after doing that, I suppose. But anyway, I'm, I'm rambling as usual. Anyway, give it a go. See, see what you think if you haven't read it before. Don't let the title put you off because it put me off initially, but I was bloody glad that I got into it. Also, um, look out for Arthur C. Clarke's uh, short story collections. Those are also very good. And of course, um, Space Odyssey is really good. Oh, and another beauty is um, Childhood's End. That's a, an early um, Arthur C. Clarke um, story. <clears throat> about um aliens coming down and you know the folklore of of, of the devil it's really interesting very surreal very surreal book um, but i found it really hard to get hold of back in the day because it was out of print um well, you can probably get it now though but uh, there we are okay i'm going to leave it there um thanks for listening Sorry, it's always such a bloody shambles. But if you take anything back from this, it's that it's worth reading. Um, right, I'm going to say cheerio. And hopefully Sir Percival will do the same. Cheerio. Cheerio, you sexy fuckers. Bloody filth. Cheers. But no, this is uh, a very different uh, story indeed. A very completely different fucking bastard saw it on a bookshelf um, when I was 17 years old and was quite intrigued by the twatting fucking update. <laughs>
bastard. Fuck's sake. <sighs> I read it back then when I was 17. Um, and I reread it last year just to see if it still um, did did the thing. But it, you know, do 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 come. 